Hi there. December 2017 saw the introduction of the renewed cervical screening program in Australia and the release of the associated updated cervical screening guidelines. This has presented some management challenge to clinicians as we all try to adjust to the um, updated guidelines and the change in management. Um, what we're going to do today is aim to discuss some of the more commonly encountered clinical challenges um, to try and assist us in making sure that we're providing the right test at the right time to our patients with appropriate follow-up in place. Um, all of the uh, cases discussed today and the information um, are taken directly from the updated guidelines which can be found at the website shown on the screen now. So the first case that we're going to discuss today is that of a young woman under the age of 25. This has probably been one of the more uh, difficult areas of the, the new program um, as the shift in age of commencement of screening has moved to 25. So our first case today is a 24 year old who attends for a cervical screening test following her last normal pap test being performed under the old program two years ago. Her past pap test was normal, she's asymptomatic and she has an unremarkable medical history. So it's important that we understand the reasoning why we are moving the age to start screening to 25. If we understand the behaviour of human papillomavirus and the epidemiology of development of cervical cancer, then we can very confidently um, understand why we are commencing screening at age 25. Um, we know that 99.7% of cancers of the cervix are related to human papillomavirus infection. We know that human papillomavirus infection is very, very common in young women within the first few years following sexual debut. We know that the majority of young women will clear these infections on their own within one to two years. So we don't want to be screening these young women and identifying all of these early HPV infections and then leading to over-investigation and over-treatment of these women. We know with our understanding of the development of cervical cancer that it is the persistent HPV infections that are the, the cause for concern. So we know that on average it takes about 10 years to, to develop from human papilloma virus infection to persisting infection to development of cervical cancer. So our screening test is designed to identify those persisting infections. Cervical cancer is a very rare disease in a woman under 25 and a population-based screening program is not designed to detect those cancers. There's good evidence that screening women under the age of 25 does nothing to reduce that woman's risk of developing an invasive cervical cancer before age 30. Head to head, our modelling has shown that compared to cytology screening at age 20, performing HPV DNA testing from age 25 does in fact reduce the prevalence and incidence of cervical cancer by about 15%. Okay. Um, you will see on the screen now that there are some situations where it is worth considering offering testing um, in women under age 25. These scenarios include uh, symptomatic women. So if a woman of any age presents with symptoms of abnormal bleeding, which includes post-coital bleeding that's persistent or unexplained intermenstrual bleeding, she should be offered co-testing. If there has been sexual activity prior to age 14, um, for example, in the case of childhood sexual abuse, um, a woman can be considered for testing between age 20 to 24. If a woman is sexually active and has been immunodeficient for more than five years, or importantly, if a woman under 25 is still to complete follow-up testing following a previous abnormality under the old program, she should be offered uh, follow-up testing as per the new guidelines. So for our case today of our 24-year-old who has presented for a, a, a cervical screening test two years following a previous test under the old program, we can reassure her if she's asymptomatic and she's um, a, a healthy woman, 
uh, that, that she does not need a cervical screening test until age 25. We can consider other opportunistic things in that consultation, such as STI testing, which is important. We know that as the National Register is phased in and as new functions are added over the coming months to the Register, that eventually we anticipate that these women under 25 who would have been due for testing under the old program will receive a letter from the Register uh, explaining the rationale um, for shifting um, the age of testing to, to 25 and that that is when their next test would be due. That function is not yet active under the Register but that will be one of the future functions that we anticipate to be phased in. In the meantime, it's important that practices just consider um, the recalls that may be in place under the old program for women under the age of 25 who may actually not have a, a cervical screening test yet indicated. So our second case today is going to look at the commonly encountered scenarios of follow-up testing following previous abnormalities under the, the old program. So our first case is a 28-year-old woman who presents 12 months after a low-grade pap test result under the old program, or sometimes this may have been referred to as a CIN1 report. So in this scenario, this woman should be offered a HPV test. That's what we would write on the request form, a HPV test. We would include the clinical information of the previous abnormal result in the clinical history on the request form. If this woman then had a negative HPV test, she could be safely returned to five yearly screening interval. Um, and we can see on the screen there now the flow chart that relates to follow up of women with a previous abnormality. It very clearly outlines for us the follow up testing that would occur in this woman. Our third case today follows on with that same scenario of a woman with a previous abnormality. In this case, we've got our 28-year-old woman who presents having had previous treatment for a histologically confirmed high-grade lesion. She's had a previous LEPS procedure for that and she had her first test of cure, so a cytology test and a HPV DNA 12 months ago. So for her, we should offer her a second test of cure and under the new program, this is termed a co-test. So co-test refers to liquid-based cytology plus HPV DNA. On the request form, we will request a co-test and we will write all of the history details there about her previous abnormality and treatment. And then depending on the outcome of that test of cure, her follow-up will then be determined. For a woman to be returned to five yearly screening, she needs to have annual co-testing until both results are negative on two occasions. Um, and that again is outlined nicely in the flow chart that you can see on the screen there now. So case four today is looking at the scenario of a symptomatic woman. So a big change in the new guidelines is that there is a specific section of the guideline that deals with symptomatic women. And this is a very important step in, ass in assisting us to make sure that women presenting with symptoms are managed in an appropriate manner. So case four involves a 40 year old woman who has presented to you with recurrent postcoital bleeding over the past three to four months. In this scenario, a co-test, so again our co-test is a liquid-based cytology plus HPV DNA, should be requested. And the history details relating to the nature of her abnormal bleeding and her symptoms should be clearly recorded on the request form. There's a lovely flow chart in the guidelines that you can see on the screen there now that do um, outline management of symptomatic women. Um, so that's important to, to be following that and be familiar with that. Um, now, there has been a little bit of confusion um, come out of, of this management of, of symptomatic women. We have found that some laboratories regarding um, reporting of these, these results, even if the co-test is completely negative, some laboratories are recording this as a, a high risk result, which has resulted in some, some anxiety for both clinicians and women. Um, what we need to keep in mind is that 
these are investigative tests rather than screening tests. So if a woman is presenting with abnormal symptoms of persisting postcoital bleeding, of unexplained intermenstrual bleeding, these women need to be thoroughly worked up and uh, reviewed by a specialist gynaecologist to, to get to the bottom of, of, of their symptoms. So really in these scenarios, the co-test is just forming part of the investigative workup on the, the way to referring these women for specialist review. Some of the confusion has come where if, you know, quite commonly young women who are using hormonal contraceptives will commonly experience breakthrough bleeding. So we do need to consider rationalising when we may do the co-test. So for example, if a woman is in the first three months of a new contraceptive pill, or if she's in the first three months of an implant on implant, where there may be a clear explanation for their bleeding, we may not rush in with that co-test, but it is about balancing having a, a low threshold for investigating women, appropriately investigating and referring women with clearly abnormal bleeding, um, and thinking about other causes. So thinking about STI screening and pelvic ultrasounds as part of the workup of these women. So for case five today, I'm going to cover um, women following up after hysterectomy. Again, this is a bit of a minefield because depending on the indication for the hysterectomy or the woman's past screening history, um, we're going to need to determine what follow-up this woman may need. So case five is a 52-year-old woman who has attended for her yearly vault smear, which she's been coming in for every year since her hysterectomy five years ago. Now, in determining follow-up for this woman, we really need to look at the reason for her hysterectomy. Um, is there a past history of a confirmed high-grade lesion? Did she have her hysterectomy as treatment for a confirmed high-grade lesion? If the hysterectomy was done purely for benign reasons, such as fibroids or heavy bleeding, and the woman has had a completely normal screening history, then she probably doesn't need to have ongoing vault smears. Uh, there's a separate uh, section of the guidelines that specifically looks at management of women following hysterectomy and you'll see there on the screen now that there is a, a flow chart that looks at management of these women. Um, it's important to, to recognise that no further surveillance is needed if a woman has been treated for a histologically confirmed high grade lesion and has completed a test of cure. Um, or if there has been no evidence of cervical pathology on her hysterectomy specimen. So it's really important in managing these women that we need to find out uh, the type of hysterectomy that a woman has had. If a woman has had a subtotal hysterectomy, that means that she may still actually have a cervix, so she does in fact need to continue five yearly cervical screening. It's important to track down the exact histopathology of any past abnormalities um, or of her, her hysterectomy specimen, because sometimes what was actually found on histology may differ to what the woman may think um, she had go on in her history. Um, so that's really important to try and track down the information as best as possible to, to determine the woman's future screening needs. If there was any record of adenocarcinoma in situ on the histopathology, the woman will need to have indefinite annual co-testing. The National Register is currently being phased in um, and one of the current um, operations of the Register is that you are able for women with past abnormalities in the, under the old program to contact the National Register to, to find out details that may have been recorded previously at register level um, of previous abnormalities. So that, that is a function of the register that's currently up and running that may assist clinicians in helping to determine history for these women. So the last uh, group of women that we're going to talk about today are women who may have special screening needs that, that differ from, from the general population. So women, um, there are a couple of groups of women who need additional or more frequent testing. So the first group of women that we're going to talk about are DES exposed women or diethyl still bestrol exposed women. So DES is a synthetic estrogen that was used in Australia between 1940 and 1970 to prevent miscarriages. Unfortunately, it's subsequently been shown to be a potent carcinogen and it does increase exposed women's risk of developing um, clear cell carcinomas of the cervix and the vagina. 
So any woman who is exposed in utero or any woman who, who herself took DES do require yearly uh, colposcopy and vulvoscopy with a gynaecologist and also yearly co-testing indefinitely. So any woman with a history of DES exposure should really be having specialist referral and yearly follow-up. The second group of women who require um, more frequent screening are immunosuppressed women. Okay, so this is women who have had uh, solid organ transplant recipients, uh, HIV positive women, women who are immunosuppressed as a result of treatment of conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, bone marrow uh, transplant recipients who are being treated for graft versus host diseases. These are all women who um, are immunosuppressed and they should actually receive screening every three years rather than every five years. And of course we need to very clearly write those details and that history of immunosuppression on the request form so that the woman will be appropriately um, receiving Medicare rebatable screening every three years rather than every five years. Women under 25 who are sexually active and who have been immunosuppressed for more than five years are also eligible to be considered for screening between age 20 and 25. Another group that I want to talk about are underscreened women. So um, we know that there is a, a new um, uh, option that uh, for self-collection and that applies to women who are underscreened, so women who are over 30 who are more than two years overdue for screening um, are regarded as being underscreened. These women are eligible for Medicare rebatable self-collected HPV testing. We would want to reserve it though for, pa for patients who just for whatever reason are unable to have a clinician collected sample or who have continued to decline that. So, the first option and the, the best practice screening method is for a clinician collected sample. But we do want to somehow capture those underscreened women who for whatever reason just cannot have a clinician collected sample. So these women do have the option of being offered a self collected sample. This self collected sample will happen at the clinic either behind the curtain or we'll send them off to the bathroom at the clinic. It's a self-collected swab that the woman inserts into the vagina herself much like using a tampon um, and then that gets sent off to the lab for a, a, a HPV DNA test. Um, again it, it's not as good as a clinician collected sample but it is a way of capturing these women uh, because we do know that 80% of our cervical cancers are still occurring in our underscreened women so it is a good strategy to capture these women and ensure that they are still somehow screened. We don't endorse the commercially available uh, self-testing kits. Um, that's not part of the national screening program. Um, the self-collection option is really something that needs to be talked through with the woman in the clinic setting and you know, performed on the clinic premises after the woman has been fully informed.